So I just want to introduce Jen. For those of you who don't know her, she's from North Carolina. Um, she did her PhD in New Orleans and then came to CSU to do a postdoc. Um, and now she's an assistant professor doing really amazing things with bison. Um, and so I don't want to take away any of her time. So let's all give Jen a hand. Wow. Thank you guys so much. This is a, a really great turnout. And I would like to think that you're out here to see me talk, but I have a feeling that the Prairie Thunder Imperial Brown Ale might be one of the big reasons you're here. Um, so of course, uh, the first thing I'm going to do is thank Pateras Creek for hosting us and for brewing us this fabulous beer for which a portion of the proceeds are going to go directly to the project. So. Um, yeah, try it, buy it, thank Pateros Creek, okay? So um, tonight I'm here to talk to you about our project to reintroduce bison in northern Colorado. And so I titled my talk, Bison in Your Backyard, um, because I'm really excited <laughs> about our idea to breed genetically friendly bison that are, I think ultimately are gonna replace the dog as man's best friend. <laughs> Um, <laughs> no, um, but seriously, if you live in northern Colorado, this is your backyard, okay? Whether you've been up to Soapstone Prairie and Red Mountain Open Space or not, um, this is what you should consider your backyard. It's an amazing habitat. It is a relatively, in, it's a well intact um, short grass prairie. And if you haven't been there, I encourage you to go. Um, not only is it beautiful scenery, but there are fantastic hiking trails, um, great birding if you're a birder, uh, and just, you know, a little something for everyone. It's also home to the Lindemeyer site, which is um, one of the archaeological sites that uh, shows evidence for some of the uh, humans that came before our Native Americans. So um, culturally, it's very rich in addition to the ecological treasure it is. So I am here primarily to talk about this lovely beast, the bison. Um, and so this is actually a bull from a neighboring herd over at the Rawhide Power Plant. They do have some bison there. Um, and one of the things I often get asked when, when I'm talking about bison is, okay, so what's the difference? What's a bison? What's a buffalo? I mean, are they the same thing? Are they not? And the answer is yes, okay? so. Um, technically speaking, the scientific name for our North American bison, at least the Plains bison, is bison, bison, bison. All right, scientists got really creative on that one. <laughs> um, and so um, uh, the scientific name is bison. Now, colloquially, you can call it a buffalo, um, and that name is particularly relevant to the Native American communities that call them buffalo. So. In North America, it's really accepted to call them both. But if you're talking about true buffalo, we actually mean like the Cape buffalo in Africa or water buffalo in Asia. So those are true buffalo. And what we have are bison. Now, in case you don't know, there are actually two types of bison considered a subspecies. So we have the plains bison on the left and the wood bison on the right. And the wood bison are primarily found up in Canada and Alaska. And they look a little different, all right? So just to point out a few of the characteristics, the plains bison on the left has a very distinct cape. So if you see that fur that goes over the shoulders and kind of stops right behind the front leg, that doesn't exist on the wood bison. They kind of have this gradient of fur that goes all the way back to the end of the animal. Also, our bison have, you know, the hair that sticks straight up, okay, which I think is way cooler than the floppy hairdo that the wood bison have. Uh, our bison also have fur on the front leg. I like that too because it kind of makes them look a little tougher. Um, and so there are a lot of there are a lot of kind of physical differences that that you can tell, and that's primarily just an adaptation to their different environments. So now for a little history. Okay, I think we're all pretty aware of the the trials and tribulations that bison have had to go through to still be here today. So this picture is a pretty iconic picture from the 1800s when the hide hunt was really kind of at its max. Um, and so, in case you can't tell, these are all bison skulls, just the skulls. And they're piled, of course, um, uh, really high, and you can see the, rel the size of the person there at the bottom for kind of scale. And so, um, 
you know, we got down to very low numbers of bison in North America. Um, but thanks to the efforts of some cattle ranchers and actually some folks who, um, from the Native American communities who help protect bison, um, they've actually made something of a comeback. And so today in North America, there are about 400 to 500,000 bison, depending on who you ask. And largely, those are bison that are in the commercial meat industry. About 20,000 bison are in conservation herds, um, which of course are managed a little bit differently. Um, but as a, as a whole, it's, um, we're, we're pretty um, confident in saying that bison restoration has been somewhat successful, considering we have half a million, close to half a million today. And so this is a picture from a herd in South Dakota. And one of the things that, um, that happened is when we got down to really low numbers of bison, um, there were some um, chance interbreedings of bison. And so um, there, were, there were instances where bison may have um, come in contact with cattle, and there were some cases where cattle ranchers um, may have been experimenting and intentionally bred bison with cattle. And this is a long time ago. And so as a result, for the bison that we have still in North America, in some populations, there's a remnant amount of cattle DNA in those bison. So these are three really cool looking bison. I actually really love this picture. But if one of these bison happened to have cattle DNA, a little bit of cattle DNA in them, you would never know it, okay? They don't look any different. Um, they don't taste any different. <laughs> um, but it, it's, it's there, okay? And so it's, um, it's been of interest because that kind of impacts the way the species can be managed, is managed, and some of the conservation issues um, that come up. Now, I want to be very distinct that we are not talking about them being beefalo, okay? You, I hear that term passed around a lot. And a beefalo is a very different beast altogether. Okay, so this is an intentional breeding of cattle and bison, and there's actually a beefalo industry. Okay, and so technically a beefalo is something that's three-eighths bison and five-eighths cattle. And these are some examples of beefalo in this current industry. And I think it's really important to make the distinction that the current um, commercial bison industry, they absolutely do not breed bison with cattle. And any cattle DNA that may be in those bison is a very, very small amount, and I mean like 5% or less. And the, the comparison that I've heard made and that, I w that I've often made myself is that it's akin to um, us having Neanderthal DNA in us. And so for purposes of demonstration, I actually recently had my DNA tested. <laughs> and <laughs> I found out that I am 2.8% Neanderthal, okay? <laughs> I don't know if you could tell, like maybe I had that really strong brow or whatever, but um, I am. I'm 2.8% Neanderthal, okay? Now, does that make me any less of a human? Absolutely not. So for the bison that have a little bit of cattle DNA, it absolutely doesn't make them any less bison than um, your bison that doesn't have cattle DNA. Um, but it might mean that you might integrate them into a conservation strategy a little bit differently, okay? So I think the real value for knowing the genetics of your animal is really to determine how you're going to manage it. So let's talk a little bit about Yellowstone, um, because that's a really key component to our project. And most of you, when you think of Yellowstone, you think of bison. Of course, you come in contact to them, uh, contact with them um, fairly closely. You know, they come up to your vehicles. Um, and bison, has a re uh, bison and Yellowstone have a really unique history. So when the bison populations were at their lowest, there were probably, the estimates vary, but probably close to 25 to 30 bison left in the entire park. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, there were some of those cattle ranchers that did take bison onto their property and protect them. And at a time when um, the government of the United States decided to protect the bison, they then brought some of those bison that had been preserved on ranches back to Yellowstone. And so today, what we have in Yellowstone is a mixture of bison that come from five foundation herds. And that makes them um, genetically rich, okay? We have a really genetically diverse population there. 
And so um, when you think about bison from a conservation perspective, that's what you want. You want a population that's rich in genetic diversity, that's rather large, okay? So Yellowstone National Park typically has, has anywhere from 3,000 to 5,000 bison, and that's a pretty large herd considering that there's only 20,000 in conservation herds currently. Um, so it's a great um, population to target for conservation. But the problem is this. Okay, so this is Brucella abortus. It's a bacterium that causes the disease brucellosis. And while it doesn't cause the animal's death, it does cause, at least in bison and cattle, um, abortion and weak calves. And the problem is it can be spread to other animals, um, like I said, cattle, but also other wildlife, and people can get it. Okay, so in people it causes what's called undulant fever. So you really kind of just feel really bad for you know, months and months at a time. You get fevers. If you have underlying health conditions, they can be exacerbated and become a major problem if you contract brucellosis. And so um, there was a really big effort in the United States to remove this disease from the cattle population. And we've been successful at doing that. And really, we've removed this disease um, from the animal population with the exception of the greater Yellowstone area. And so the bison in Yellowstone um, do have this disease to some extent. Not every single bison has it, but it has a fairly high prevalence. And so that's a problem. If you want to conserve this really rich, um, genetically rich um, population, you can't just take those animals out of the park. Because if you take them out of the park, you take the disease with it, and then you can infect other animals and people. So um, what I'm going to talk a little bit about is our research. And um, I'm a reproductive physiologist. And so uh, one of the things we do is we try to use assisted reproduction um, a, a lot in livestock, actually. We do it to increase um, reproductive efficiency. But we saw a real opportunity here to help bison by using these techniques to produce Yellowstone offspring that do not have brucellosis. So um, we were fortunate enough to realize that our lab is right across the street from the USDA, who um, at the USDA APHIS group, and they do a lot of research with bison, particularly bison from Yellowstone National Park. And uh, we have found a great partnership with them. In fact, um, it took someone from South Dakota to introduce me to someone who worked right across the street from me and had access to Yellowstone bison. And these are some of the bison that have been in our program. And um, they are a federal quarantine facility, so we can bring bison in from Yellowstone National Park um, and, and use them for our work and potentially pass them through quarantine and reintroduce them to the landscape. And so um, it was just really fortunate that this facility is right across the street from our lab and that we could combine our forces to really make a difference here. So when I talk about assisted reproductive technologies, a lot of people think of these types of very sophisticated things. So um, this is actually um, the injection of a sperm into an egg. And so you can see right there at the end of that little pipette that's coming in from the right-hand side, there's a sperm head right there and they're gonna just leave that into the egg and, and you can fertilize an egg that way. But assisted reproduction means a lot more than that. It doesn't have to be that sophisticated and technological. So we were talking about things like artificial insemination, okay? Embryo recovery and transfer. So taking an embryo from one animal and putting it into another. In vitro embryo production, so when you think of humans that go into IVF clinics that might be having some sort of uh, reproductive difficulty, a lot of times they will do IVF. Um, ICSI, that was the picture of the sperm being injected into the egg. That stands for intracytoplasmic sperm injection. I know you're all going to remember that later. <laughs> um, embryo freezing, okay, so being able to freeze embryos and ship them all over the world, okay that type of things for transfer. Um, gonadal tissue preservation, um, synchronizing reproductive cycles of females, all of these things can be, sittered, can be considered assisted reproductive technologies and including cloning, though we're not, we're not cloning bison, don't worry. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the details of our science. I'm not gonna give you graphs or charts, I promise. But I am gonna try to generally explain to you how we create babies. All right, as if you, I mean, I know you know how we create babies, but <laughs> how we do it in the lab, okay? Like our style. <laughs> okay, 
So in this picture, what you see are um, different boxes, and if they have a yellow around them, that means that the genes of that particular animal or embryo come from Yellowstone, and blue means it's just something else, okay? So for the first example, what we can do is we can take a, a female from Yellowstone that has Yellowstone genetics, and um, we can collect an embryo from her. So we can allow her to breed naturally with a male if he's available, or we can do artificial insemination. And then what we can do is a cleaning step, and that's what the asterisk represents. And to do that, we basically wash the embryo through a fluid that um, erodes kind of the outer protective layer of the embryo, and with it can shed any of the pathogen that might be stuck to the surface of the embryo. So we can then take that embryo, put it into a female that is healthy, does not have the disease, and she doesn't necessarily have to be from Yellowstone. So she's just your surrogate mother, and then she can give birth to um, a calf that has the Yellowstone genetics but doesn't have the disease. Now the other thing we can do is from the male side. So we can collect sperm from bison bulls that are positive for brucellosis. And again, we have a method of cleaning the sperm. And so uh, we can centrifuge the sperm, which means we just spin it really hard, and it collects, the sperm cells actually collect down at the bottom of the tube, and the semen, the component where probably the bacteria are, stay at the top, and so we can separate the sperm from that semen and effectively wash it free of the disease. So the bacterium stays in the semen, and we have the clean sperm at the bottom. We can then um, freeze that and then artificially inseminate females f that have Yellowstone genetics to get um, offspring, from offspring that have Yellowstone genetics. So again, another method of cleaning the gametes. And finally, um, <laughs> yes, it's unfortunate when they do happen to pass away, but if they do, uh, we can collect the sperm and the eggs. <laughs> and this is actually one of our most powerful tools. Um, so um, every year, um, when bison migrate out of the park, some of those are collected. And those that are sent to slaughter, our team actually goes and we work in the slaughterhouses in Montana. And this is by no means a glamorous job, trust me, particularly in the winters of Montana. <laughs> uh, two years ago, I think it was uh, 27 below when we were working. But actually last year, it wasn't so bad. It was like record highs, like 50 degrees. So you just never know what to expect. Um, but we can go in. And for these animals that are sent to slaughter, we can go in and we can collect their eggs and we can collect their sperm. And then we collect it on site. Actually, it's kind of interesting. I work in a Super 8 motel most of the time for this with my team. And we collect the eggs and then we ship them overnight to Colorado. And then my team of students and technicians here, they get the eggs and they fertilize them in the lab. And one week later, we have embryos that we can then freeze and transfer in the breeding season. So this all happens in January, February. Bison breeding season is July, August, September, maybe half of October. And we can transfer those embryos during the breeding season and create calves that way. And so um, those are kind of our three main uh, techniques for generating offspring from bison that have brucellosis. So of course, when we're successful, we get calves, which we love because they're absolutely adorable. I actually really like this picture because this was our calf, our first calf this year. And it looks kind of like he has his mom in the back, number 50, that's his mother. And then he has like this team of like really mean ants that's like, if you screw with my nephew, I'm going to rough you up. Um, which I kind of love about the bison, the fact that they're really protective. Um, so, you know, this is research that I've been working on for about four years. And, you know, the first year we had our first success uh, with embryo transfer, just straight embryo transfer. And we actually sent that pregnant mother to the Bronx Zoo in New York City. And so she gave birth there. And, and that calf still lives there. And, well, he's not a calf anymore. He's actually this beautiful, beautiful beast that I like to say, oh, he's going to be such a stud one day. Like, literally, he's actually going to contribute his genes by being a stud to the captive bison population. Um, but so every year we've had a little bit more success. You know, we're still learning a lot about the reproductive cycles of bison and how to maximize the efficiency of these different techniques. But we began to realize that, gosh, you know, if we keep doing this, we're going to have a lot of calves. And what are we going to do with these guys? Um, but fortunately, our colleagues at the USDA had already been thinking about this. And they had begun to talk to the city. 
and um, they had for a long time, before I ever came into the picture, been talking about getting bison up to Soapstone Prairie. And so this is a picture of Soapstone Prairie looking west um, towards Red Mountain open space as well, and you can see Meeker and Longs in the back. Um, and so uh, it, it kind of just all came together that our program started to have these successes right about the time when the climate was right to bring bison back to Soapstone Prairie and Red Mountain Open Space. And, and this had been in the plan for this particular piece of land for some time. And um, my colleagues at the USDA had been working on this project and it just kind of all fit just at the right time. And I mean, you really have to give the city of Fort Collins credit for one, buying a property like this where um, it has a cultural value that just cannot be, uh, a number just cannot be put on that, but where they actively are involved in restoring and maintaining the prairie and also bringing back species that have been there in the past but may not be there anymore. So I have to mention that they've also reintroduced black-footed ferrets, okay? And that's an endangered species, right? And I don't know if you know, but Pateros Creek also brewed a beer for the ferret called Prairie Bandit, so. Uh, <laughs> I, I think ours is better, but, you know. Uh, but, and I also had to show, this is actually a picture I just took off the Facebook page for the Breeding Center today, and I just thought it was appropriate since we're getting towards Halloween and it looks really creepy, but they also look really cute, so that's why I included that picture there. But what's really exciting is that we have this space now in northern Colorado where we have this this endangered species that's been reintroduced. And we're about to bring back a species that's been gone for a very long time, but historically ranged there. And in fact, where the, where the ferrets were reintroduced and where the bison will eventually roam overlap. So we're gonna have this movement towards um, a landscape that's been uh, missing for a long time, kind of with this interconnection of all these different species. So to give you an idea of the landscape that we're talking about and the, the size and the space that we're talking about. So the green represents Soapstone Prairie. The red is Red Mountain Open Space, which is managed by the county. And then on the right is the Meadow Springs Ranch. And that's also owned by the city. So the bison pasture is outlined in yellow. And so we have about 2,000 acres that have been laid out for the bison. So currently we've only raised enough money to fence in 1,000 acres. So that's what they're gonna be reintroduced to. But what's really exciting is I think the prospect for expansion of this project. And with these three properties, you have about 60,000 continuous acres right here together. And it's one of the only untouched corridors in Colorado where the Front Range has not developed to the point where animals can't migrate from the mountains to the prairie. So this is one of the only migration corridors for large mammals uh, left in Colorado along the Front Range. So it's got a ton of potential. And so you can see where the bison are going to be. We have the east and the west pasture there in the southern part. So that's where they're going to be reintroduced initially. Okay. And I encourage you to go up there and look at it. I mean, the landscape is just beautiful. And it's not just ferrets and it's not just bison. But these are pronghorn, antelope. And as you can see, um, it's just an amazing landscape. And I think you have to really be proud to live in a community that not only has this resource available, but the, the people of the city actually um, uh, uh, again and again vote to support these efforts with their tax dollars. And it's a, re a really, really unique place to live in the United States. Now I want to mention also that, <laughs> yeah, Fort Collins, yeah. I mean, come on. <laughs> Now, I also want to mention that our project isn't just about bison. Um, and so we have a project that was funded by the One Health Initiative at Colorado State University. And the One Health Initiative is basically CSU's recognition that when you protect the health of animals, people, or the environment, that you're going to affect all three components. And so this is really their way of moving into this um, kind of progressive mindset of research and funding the finding answers for some of the big questions and big problems in our society um, and understanding how all of it's kind of connected together. And so we were funded, this is Dr. Leba Pechar and Kate Wilkins, Kate is in the audience, hey. So Kate is doing the, e she's a, um, a PhD student for Dr. Leba Pechar and she is doing ecological studies surrounding the reintroduction. So they're looking at 
um, the effects of bison on the grasses and the small mammals and the bird populations and looking at those effects before and after the reintroduction so that we can understand how bison impact the health, the health of the prairie. And then she sent me some of these pictures today. She also has wildlife cams. And so, you know, as part of the process of um, understanding how it changes, you know, not just the species that are there, but how they're using the space, um, she's been able to observe a lot of different species. So thank you to Kate for sharing these pictures. Feel free to talk to her. <laughs> um, and also, we have a partner at the Denver Zoo who's doing the social science component. Okay, so um, Dr. Rebecca Garvoyle is leading that charge, um, but they're talking to people um, before and after the reintroduction to get an idea of why they go to Soapstone Prairie. And I'm just saying Soapstone because that's where they're doing the surveys. But um, this applies to Red Mountain too. But why they go to this space, um, what they do when they're there, and does bringing back a species like the bison, does that really drive people to go out and to experience these landscapes more? Do they connect to the landscape better? Um, and just kind of, you know, what their opinions are in general. And a lot of this work is really valuable because, you know, the city and the county will look at this and help make policy decisions based on um, some of the findings of this research. Um, in addition, Dr. Garvoyle is also going to be talking to our agricultural stakeholders in the area. So there are ca cattle that graze on Soapstone and Red Mountain, and so they want to understand what their thoughts are, um, how they feel about it, um, and just try to understand um, how to make it a good collaboration for everyone all together. And so that really brings us to today where we're ready actually to bring these bison back to Soapstone Prairie. And it's incredibly exciting. Uh, we have 10 bison that are gonna go out on November 1st. And so there are seven adult females. We have two yearling heifers and we have a calf who was born June 5th. And so on November 1st, we're gonna open the gates and we're gonna let these guys out onto a prairie that has been missing them for a very, very long time. And so, um, I want to invite you all to that. First of all, um, we have an event that's going to happen on campus from 10 a.m. to noon. And unfortunately, the field trip up to actually watch the gates open is sold out. But we're all going to come back here for beers after, so there's always that too. <laughs> Um, but at 10 a.m. to noon, we're going to have some booths where you can learn a little bit more from all of the different agencies. And we're going to have some speakers from a variety of organizations, including the Native American community. Um, and that's a really important uh, component or group of people that we've tried to engage in this project. And um, they're very excited to be coming. They're going to offer a blessing for the herd and do um, uh, a couple of demonstrations that are culturally relevant for them both um, at the presentation from 10 to noon and then actually on site for the bison as well. And so that's all on November 1st. Now I wanna recognize our team. And so um, on the left here we have Kate, Justin, and Dalen. Those folks are from the city and they have really driven this effort from the city's perspective. Uh, Megan Flanagan, she is in the purple. She is the representative of the county uh, for Red Mountain Open Space, and so she's been the point person there. In the back, we have Dr. Jack Ryan and Matt McCollum in the black uh, puffy jacket. He's actually here sitting in the back. You guys should clap for this guy because he... <laughs> I mean... He has been a champion for the bison on the government side. I mean, through budget cuts and, you know, just trying to reallocate animals. He has kept these animals uh, protected in his care um, along with his team. And so they should really be given credit for, um, one, helping us to keep these animals and to getting us access to the Yellowstone bison. Um, Dr. Rebecca, Rebecca Garvo from the Denver Zoo is in the middle, that's me, and of course Kate Wilkins who is doing the ecological work. Uh, we're missing Dr. Leba Pechar, but she was in an earlier picture. And this is, this is kind of the core team, but I mean an effort like this takes a ton of people. Um, and so, like we could probably have 40 or 50 people in this picture for anyone who's done anything to make this project possible. And so just some final acknowledgements here. Of course, the One Health Initiative, which gave us a big boost to get this project um, really off the ground from the research perspective. 
the Denver Zoo, who's given um, their time on the research side, but also financially. Defenders of Wildlife, they actually gave us um, a lot of financial support for the fencing um, that's pretty expensive when you start fencing in 1,000 and 2,000 acres. Um, so that was great. The Warner College of Natural Resources um, uh, has given money as well as Bernice Barber Foundation to support research. And the Cape May County Park Zoo, they actually donated some bison, or a bison, and actually the Six Flags in New Jersey, they also donated bison. So I don't know why our bison are coming from New Jersey, but for some reason, um, I think they're gonna be really feisty, which I kind of really love about them, so. So the last thing I'm going to throw at you, of course, is that um, when, when you have an effort like this, it takes a lot of time, effort, but it also takes a lot of money. And we're currently having a fundraising campaign. As you can see, we're a little bit away from our goal. <laughs> uh, so I would encourage you, if you have $5 or $500 or $5,000, hey, <laughs> I'll ask for it. Um, if you could donate to the cause, we would appreciate it. 100% of the money goes straight to the project. Um, and we have until November 2nd to try to raise $20,000 and it's going to go into fencing that next portion and to supporting the building of the corral which um, we use to bring the bison in and do their health checks and just to make sure they're they're doing well. Um, and so actually, yeah, I wanted to point that out. There's the website for it. Um, and so with that, I will answer any of your questions. Yes? From an ecological standpoint, I was fascinated about the quality you have to put into the um, hay that's going to subsidize them for yes. the winter. So would you mind sharing that? Because I thought that was pretty cool. Sure. Very so. Cool, but so cool. <laughs> so she was asking about um, what we're going to feed them, so the hay. So obviously they're on a beautiful short grass prairie, but what we have to acknowledge is that the bison that we're going to reintroduce have lived their entire lives in captivity. And so we are trying to make the transition for them as easy as possible. So we will be feeding them through the winter as necessary and monitoring how much they eat. But the hay that we bring in is all certified weed-free hay. So we do not do any potential damage to the prairie and bring in any weeds that shouldn't be there and so we're pretty conscious of that um, you know on, on all levels of, of the impact that we're that we're causing on the prairie and so we want the impact to just be the good things that the bison are going to do and not something that we do uh, by bringing in you know hay just from anywhere yeah yes Oh, that's a great question. Um, so he asked about the fencing. And the fencing is a five-strand uh, fence. And the top wire and the bottom wire are smooth. So it's wildlife friendly. So uh, pronghorn can go under, elk can go over. And in, you know, so species can go over and under without getting snagged. And it should not um, interrupt their migration patterns at all. And so the, the fence is about five feet high. Um, and so. As long as the bison are happy, we think they're going to stay in, which is kind of the, kind of the hope. <laughs> I mean, I think an unhappy bison is going to go anywhere it wants, so <laughs> that's the truth, <laughs> if I'm honest. Uh, but we have 10 bison on 1,000 acres. They have more than enough groceries out there for them. Yes, ma'am. So have you consulted at all with the Wichita Mountains Wildlife Refuge in Oklahoma? Do they also have bison on short grass prairies? We have not consulted with them in particular, but we consulted with um, a lot of different folks who do have bison. We consulted with the Rawhide Energy Plant, who's managed two bison herds you know, in sight's distance from this particular space. So we got a lot of great feedback from them. In fact, they've been really supportive. And uh, we actually used the same person to build our corral as it built their system. Um, but we've also talked to a lot of bison producers, um, just what, what has and hasn't worked for them. Um, so, so we've consulted a lot of folks, but not necessarily those guys. Yeah. Yes? Uh, two, two questions. The yeah. first is, you know, how, how large does this herd need to be to sort of be self-sustaining? Mm -hmm. And the second question, given that there are now bison herds that are being managed in various areas, and they're not that far from Yellowstone, is there concern that brucellosis, which is communicable, will be reintroduced and all your efforts will be involved? Great question. So um, the first question, 
was about the size of the herd. And so in this space, in the 2,000 acres that we've been given um, the go-ahead for, we can probably fit about 50 bison conservatively. Um, and that is kind of a low estimate of the number of bison that we want in that space, just to protect the integrity of the grassland. Um, now when you talk about a species being reproductively sustainable, the target for bison is 1,000 animals. Okay, so we're gonna need a lot more space to reach that capacity. <laughs> um, but like I said, there's 60,000 acres there, so if we can talk uh, you know, the city and the county into giving us more. Um, uh, that's a dream, yeah. Um, so you know, we are going to have challenges where um, we're gonna have to reproductively manage the herd for a while, but my ultimate goal, of course, is to get them to a point where the genetic diversity is great enough and the numbers are high enough that they can breed on their own. I would love to work myself out of a job. And the idea for this herd is that when it reaches um, its capacity at this space, that it can then contribute animals to other bison herds. And so in that way, we can kind of link them to our herd and kind of serve as a seed stock for the bison species as a whole. So they can go to other federal herds or public herds. And one of the things we'd really love to see is actually for them to go to Native American lands so they can start some of their own bison herds or augment their bison herds that are already existing. Um, as far as the disease coming down to Colorado, um, that really isn't very much of a concern. It's been, it's pretty well um, controlled around the park with the animals and the elk don't typically tend to migrate all the way down to Colorado. So we don't really feel like that's a main concern for us right now. Of course, if something were to change, if, you know, uh, then we could address that then, but that's not necessarily a concern now. I think we're far enough away and the migration patterns don't really reflect that being a threat to the herd. Um, so, you know, our animals will be vaccinated for brucellosis, so there will be kind of a herd immunity going on. Um, but, and we don't ever intend to kind of reintroduce them to Yellowstone. The idea is to get those valuable genetics out of the park and allow um, other herds to be augmented by our animals. Yes, sir. So, it, are there plans to expand their territory with expanded fencing? And if so, how is that being funded? So we do not have any current plans to go beyond the 2,000 acres that the city has given us. Um, we have to recognize that we have cattle grazing on that site and that there are grazing leases that currently exist around the bison pasture. Um, now, depending on the success of the project and the expiration of some of those leases, and depending on you know, the desires of the cattlemen in that area, then some of those lines can be negotiated for expansion in the future. I think, you know, everyone involved would love to see it be expanded. And largely, our ability to do that depends on um, the support for the project early on and our successes early on. And hopefully, you know, we can go from there and, and get bigger. But so we have the 2,000 acres, but nothing beyond that at this point. Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> so that's great. Yes, so um, I can go back. Let me go back to the picture of the map. Let's see. Here we go. Whoop. That's it. So um, the west, excuse me, the east side of the pasture is right along the entrance road. So before you get to the guard shack, the bison are gonna be to the west of that, that road. And so if they are in the far east side of that pasture, you'll be able to see them. Now, um, there's an arroyo on, in the west pasture that I have a feeling they're gonna take shelter in during the really hard days of the winter when the winds get going and the snow gets deep. So if you go out there, it's not guaranteed that you will see them. What's really nice is that the expanded pasture, phase two, goes right along the Cheyenne Rim Trail. And so once we get the money for that expansion, um, then you will be able to hike right along the north edge of the bison pasture. And it's at a higher elevation, so you'll be able to look over a larger landscape and potentially see them as well. Now, the, now Soapstone is open for the month of November, but they do close for December, January, and February. So if you don't get out to see them in November, you'll have to wait until March to go out and see them again. Um, but that'll be your primary viewing spot is the entrance road in the first few months.
Yeah. Yes. Uh, besides humans, uh, what are their natural predators, and are you worried about So um, the question was about natural predators in the environment and if we're worried about losing our animals. Um, so in our environment here, I would say the biggest predator we have to worry about would be um, mountain lions. And uh, while I've heard stories of them taking down you know, adult elk, bison are pretty protective. And so um, it's, it's always possible that they could take out one of our calves. Um, but I'm not really too worried about them taking out an adult. So until we get wolves in Colorado or some other larger predator, I'm not too worried about them taking out our adult bison. But we do have some pregnant females going out. So hopefully in the spring we'll have some babies on the ground, um, which then I might, you know, be like worried constantly about them. But it's fine, I'll just have a beer and, and just <laughs> suck it up. <laughs> Uh, but that's probably our biggest predator in this environment. Yes? Uh, so you mentioned that you assist with calving and all? Uh, we try not to. Um, in fact, yeah, we. what's really interesting is our, our boy who is kind of the poster child for this whole event. So let's see. Wait a minute, where is he? Anyways, he's the one with the cute face that you see here, that one. Okay, so he was the most difficult birth that I had seen thus far. And um, typically when bison give birth, they can get it all done in less than an hour, which sounds fantastic, right? Um, but this particular bison did not, oh, where did that? Oh, well, you saw him, he's there. Okay, um, and so this particular female was having trouble. It was her first calf. And she was really straining for a long time, but we also had 30 people out there watching her, which I can imagine. <laughs> does not help, it sounds really awful to me. Um, and there's, there's cameras and people and video, you know, I mean, just the whole nine yards, we were all waiting for her to drop this calf. And she was straining and straining, and so we actually called in our veterinary team because we were gonna dart and assist the mother and pull the calf and then wake them both back up. And so we had the team out there, we were all ready to go, they had their dart guns ready, and Dr. Jack Ryan said, now, wait a minute. He's kind of like, you know, the, the calm, like, wise one. He was like, just, just give her another 10 minutes. And by golly, if she did not spit that calf out in the next 10 minutes. But the problem was, it was breach. He came out backwards. So he came out back feet first. Fortunately, he was okay. So that's the closest we've ever been to having to assist in a birth. Um, bison are kind of notorious for having easy calving. And that was actually one of the reasons that cattle ranchers tried to breed with bison uh, initially was because um, they had that calving ease. Uh, so we haven't had to help any of them so far. And I guess if they're out on soapstone, they're just gonna have to tough it out. They just have to, you know, if we find one in distress, we will always help it. But, you know, it's a big space and, and we'll do what we can to help them. But fortunately for bison, that doesn't happen very often. Yes. Just real quickly, uh, you mentioned the website. And yes. Is there anything else we as people who work on us can do to help your cause? The, <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, you can visit Soapstone. Um, you, yeah, you can support us financially. You can buy the beer. That helps. <laughs> yeah. That's all I ever have to tell anyone in Fort Collins is, hey, there's a beer for it. And yeah, you get a, you get a lot of support. <laughs> um, you know, I would say, you know, keep up with our website. You know, we may have volunteer opportunities, particularly through the city or the county, to um, do things out on site, whether it's helping with trails or fencing or, you know, some other project associated with the project. Um, so, you know, they're, the city and the county are really good at organizing volunteers on site, and so that's another potential opportunity to be involved. Yeah. Yes? I saw for your um, donation website you have eight days. Are you going to maintain that beyond November 1st for those that just sort of get word of it by the Colorado and maybe still want to get we will. So even though our deadline will expire at the end of November 2nd, um, you will still be able to donate to the cause. We have a general donation page that people can donate you know, year round. It's not just associated with this kind of like one time push for a larger sum. Um, you can, you can, you know, can do some continued support um, through the advancing 
website for Colorado State. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, anybody else? All right, thank you. So I wanna thank Jen one more time. Um, feel free to stay around and buy another beer. Um, and then I'll see you guys next month for uh, a panel on climate change. Thanks so much for coming. <laughs>